hope you're doing well today. Welcome to this online training session. My name is François Riendo. I'm the Photogrammetric Workflow Specialist at SEMActive. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about how to create precise DSMs, DTMs, endpoint clouds with Correlator 3D. Uh, elevation data is a very important layer of information uh, that you will need in any kind, any different type of geospatial applications, whether it's for uh, hydrology, uh, engineering and construction, mining, or maybe just uh, doing a 3D model or doing auto rectification. Uh, you will always need to have uh, terrain data, uh, information representing uh, the topography. Uh, so we're going to look at how you can generate, uh, extract, and manipulate this type of data in Correlator 3D, and how you can get a correct result that will meet your specifications. So uh, let's start right away. What you're going to learn today is first I'm going to talk about understanding the 3D representations of Terran. So what are the different model of representation and the formats? We're going to do a difference between uh, DSM and DTM. So uh, the difference between a surface model and a Terran model. I am going to talk about uh, the importance of defining your project requirements before even starting a uh, processing and correlator treaty. What are the different options and parameters you have to generate a DSM, a surface model? How you can produce a point cloud? Uh, we will discuss the tools in Correlator 3D to extract automatically a Terran model. We also have uh, different options to edit interactively your elevation model and do some uh, corrections manually how you can assess the dam quality and accuracy and what are the different metrics uh, to evaluate uh, the accuracy of your elevation model, how you can create contours from a dam, how you can manage the different version of dams that you have generated. And finally, we'll have a look to uh, our change detection tools that allow you to uh, do a, a change, a, dif a difference between uh, two elevation model that could be from uh, different dates uh, to uh, extract changes. Okay, so let's first understand the different ways of representing Terran, the different model of representations. Uh, there's different ways uh, of representing Terran. The, one of the oldest ones is contour lines, as you can see in the graphics here. Uh, contour lines, is used since the dawn of mapping and is very uh, easy to understand and uh, graphical ways to uh, represent terrain but however quite limited in terms of representing its continuous form because terrain is is a continuous form of information uh, and uh, contour are discrete lines discrete iso lines so a line with the same elevation uh, that are showing the terrain variation, uh, the topographic variation. And so you don't really know uh, what is the elevation between the lines. You only know uh, where there is a line. And for this reason, it's, it's quite limited in modeling the terrain in its continuous form. Uh, so that's why there was another uh, model that was adopted in the beginning of digital mapping, and it's the raster grid. A regular grid of cells where each cell is storing an elevation and so the raster uh, it's the raster the same use for uh, imagery uh, the raster elevation model is probably one of the most used model uh, you will find in many GIS and that is what you're going to use for auto rectification uh, and it's very easy to exchange from software to another uh, so if I show you a raster grid in Correlator 3D in its most simplest form, it will look like this as a, it will be mapped uh, on a grayscale where the lowest numerical value uh, will be the darkest uh, color. As you can see on the bar here on the left, uh, it's going from 374 to 385 in the brightest color in the higher elevation. Uh, but now, you, obviously, with software, you can use different way of showing uh, this information. So why not turn this into color so it's already more visual? 
and you can also simulate a shading like you would have sun rays uh, on, a, on a certain angle uh, so you can use in correlate 3d this option here to shade with them variations and uh, right now we start to having something that really look li like satarian and but this is all artificial way to represent uh, what is in its simplest form a, a grid of numerical values and so that's why we will say that a, a raster grid, an elevation raster grid, is a 2.5D in terms of dimensions, uh, meaning that it's first a 2D plan, a 2D uh, raster grid, where uh, each cell store an elevation, which represents uh, uh, the third dimension. Uh, so that's why the software is able to interpret, interpret the, uh, to interpret the, um, the elevation of uh, the grid and turn it into some kind of 3D view like this. But it's kind of an, a an artificial way uh, to display 2D information from the raster grid. So a uh, raster grid, mostly very used uh, in different software and different application, but it's still not a real 3D format. So for real 3D format, uh, we have what we call the, the meshes or the TIN, the triangular irregular network. So this is a real 3D format. If I'm showing you a mesh here, I'm just going to close a couple of things. And uh, if we look, so a mesh is a series of nodes which represent a uh, different point of elevation that are all linked uh, by edges forming triangles and facets. And all these nodes have uh, a real 3D geometry. So they store an X, Y, and Z. So that's why a mesh is considered a real 3D model. And it's a continuous model. Uh, this is what it will be used for 3D model, as you can see here. And uh, but traditionally, kind of strange because that the the tin model uh, in the different software was always kind of a proprietary format, and always difficult to exchange from uh, one software to another. And for this reason, the regular grid uh, seems to be m most uh, used and also more easy to uh, to integrate into a GIS and for doing many uh, the different analysis. Um, so there are two different formats, the regular grid and the meshes. They will have a kind of different application where uh, the meshes will be used for 3D model and uh, the uh, raster grid will be used as more, more as a layer in a GIS or for autorectification. Uh, and then correlator 3D, uh, we will use the raster grid for editing your elevation model, but we can also uh, we support uh, the, uh, the meshes as well. And the last model of representation is the point cloud. Uh, point cloud, uh, which we, we don't have to uh, con uh, confound with uh, LiDAR, which is the technology that is used uh, to generate point cloud. But point cloud is one another way to uh, represent uh, terrain. So it's, it's a, a cloud of points. Uh, and uh, what, what is in the point cloud, the thing is, um, it's it's not a, a very practical format. Uh, you would kind of need to transform it into something else if you want to be able to use it or, or um, analyze it. So, so what I mean by that is a raw point cloud uh, is very dense, has a lot of information, but this information is in a very raw format. So what you have is, is points, but there is no relation with all the points uh, between them. And so uh, if I'm showing you here an example of a point cloud. So we have all different points like this. So you see, again, we have, we can see our terrain. It's representing in 3D. So point clouds is 3D format. Each point store an XYZ geometry. So it's a real 3D format. But because it's just a cloud of points that are kind of having no relation altogether, 
uh, it's, it's very difficult to, analyze, to do an analysis in its rough form. So you need to transform either you will have to triangulate it into a meshes or uh, maybe interpolate it into a raster. Uh, and then you will be able to, uh, to, to work out uh, from the point cloud. Uh, so, uh, so this is the, the, the last format. The point cloud, just to conclude, is a vector format, is points. Uh, so it's, uh, it's using the vector uh, geometry. So let's go back and talk about the different methods for extracting elevation data. Um, the earliest uh, method was probably going on the field and do a field survey. So that way you could uh, measure information about uh, the terrain. And with the advancement in photogrammetry uh, in 20th century, uh, that was now possible to extract information remotely from aerial photos. And so you could uh, first manually draw the contours of a map uh, with an operator doing the stereo extraction of the terrain with a stereo pair of photos. So photogrammetry is using uh, two images acquired from different angles. And uh, because of those different point of view, you can view uh, the three dimension in stereo and you can extract 3D information. Uh, so that's the basic of photogrammetry was first uh, with operators doing the manual extraction and with the uh, arriving of the digital photogrammetry, uh, then it was now possible to start automating some of these uh, tasks. So, uh, and in particular, the extraction of 3D information. So one of the techniques was called image matching. So uh, by correlating uh, the two images to find common features, then you could uh, extract elevation automatically. And now it was possible to do this very quickly, very fast and uh, you didn't need uh, someone to do it manually. So manually you would have to extract uh, break lines and uh, points, and then you could after that triangulate this information into a tin and eventually into a raster. Now it's possible to directly uh, extract the information from image matching, and that's what Correlator is doing in a very advanced way now with uh, advanced algorithms to extract automatically 3D information from stereo images and now it's very quick and can extract very dense uh, elevation model. Uh, still is based on photogrammetric principles and is doing this using a pair of, of stereo images. And so photogrammetry is, is one of the most uh, common way of extracting elevation data. Uh, Obviously, there are other uh, ways uh, we could talk about uh, interferometry, uh, for example, the SRTM uh, that you download for free uh, that is covering uh, the Earth uh, is, was done by interferometry, which use a radar sensor and uh, phase, uh, the phase of the signal to, uh, to, to create elevation, to extract elevation. There's also uh, another very well-known techniques, which is called uh, LIDAR for lar light and uh, ranging detection. Um, so it's uh, using a, a laser signal and it's uh, uh, kind of uh, extracting a point of a cloud of points. So that's why uh, LIDAR is uh, always associated with point clouds because that's the format uh, in which a LIDAR uh, survey is delivered uh, with a point cloud. Uh, so you have these different techniques. Also, there's altimetry and other ways of extracting uh, elevation data. They're not really in competition with each other. They may be all complementary. So they have different scale of application, um, different cost for each of them. But photogrammetry is used since a long time. And for this reason, there's a lot of knowledge around uh, using these techniques. And so uh, in Correlator 3D, we uh, are doing that photogrammetric type of extraction. And so now, what are the formats to store all these digital elevation models? So we have talked about the different model of representation. Uh, they are raster grid, contours, uh, tin or meshes or point clouds. They all 
have their own kind of format. And uh, the one we're using in Correlator 3D, we work with the raster grid. And so we support GeoTIFF uh, ASCII grid, so text format for storing elevation. And um, GeoTIFF is very well known and all software support that format. So it's very easy to exchange from software to another. For uh, the point clouds, we support the LAS format, which is the standard raw format of uh, point clouds where you're going to store uh, your point clouds is in LAS. And so we can generate LAS, export that format. Uh, in terms of the 3D model uh, meshes, we support the Obey J format. And so that's uh, the format we're going to use to store the 3D model and which you can export. And that will be supported by third-party software if you want to use that 3D model. OBG is quite uh, accessible. And uh, for contours, we can generate contours for, from uh, a grid uh, in Correlator 3D from a raster. And it will be stored in a shapefile or DWJ format. So these are all the formats uh, that we use to store the different uh, type of model of elevation. I would like to talk now about differentiating DSMs and DTMs. Uh, this is uh, very important to know the difference. Uh, so a DSM is a surface model. So it's a representation of the terrain that includes all surface objects. So you have the terrain plus you have uh, the object on the ground that will be buildings, trees, cars, and everything that is above uh, the ground in the topography. Um, DTM is also uh, for the terrain. So you need uh, also, if you want a representation of, of only what is on the ground, the bare earth, uh, under trees and under buildings, uh, you will use, you will create a DTM. And in Correlator 3D, uh, we can generate first a DSM, and from that DSM, we can filter and remove the buildings, trees, and create a DTM. Uh, so there's different application for DSM and DTM. There are two different products that have their own use. Uh, if you want to do a true ortho, I invite you to, uh, to look at the other webinar about ortho rectification, where I explain how to generate a true ortho. Uh, true ortho will need a DSM. And if you use the DTM uh, to do the ortho rectification, then you will only rectify the terrain and not uh, the object above, uh, not the buildings and the trees. Uh, but there's also other applications. So if you want to generate contours, you will usually use a DTM for that because you don't want to have contours on the buildings and trees. So contours are generated from DTM. And DSM might be used in kind of uh, analysis software for propagation, like if you want to put cellular antenna in an urban area, uh, you will have to have the buildings and the 3D model. So you want to, uh, to create a propagation map. So the DSM will be used for uh, that kind of uh, application where you need to have in your uh, model, you need to have all buildings and surface object for your analysis. Uh, so that's the difference between uh, the two DSM and DTM. Very important before starting a project, before you want extracting data elevation, you need to define your project requirements uh, because obviously you could generate all kinds of resolution when it's time to extract your surface model. Uh, you can customize the density of the points uh, in Correlator 3D when you do this extraction. Uh, so you need to understand uh, the requirement for elevation data. So if you only need to generate ortho, uh, well, maybe you, not, you don't need uh, a, a very dense DSM. So usually you will talk in relation to your input raw images. So let's say you have a resolution of five centimeter. Uh, you will generate your DSM in some kind of ratio of that resolution. So maybe for ortho rectification, you will only need something around five times to ten times the resolution of your input image, and that will be enough. So in Correlator 3D, you have the option to define what is your output resolution. And it's very important to think what you need. If you go in very dense resolution and you don't necessarily need that, uh, it's going to take a lot of time and you're processing uh, and you're going to lose uh, time because at the end you will have very uh, big files and maybe you don't need that 
that much uh, information if it's just for R2. Even for generating contours, uh, the Terran doesn't need, in terms of uh, if it, in its continuous form, you don't need as much uh, resolution as you need for an image. So if you have an image at 5 centimeters, an elevation model at 20 centimeters will be quite enough at the, the scale you're working uh, to represent the Terran, to generate contours, to do the auto rectification, and to do all kind of analysis, which would be for drainage or uh, that kind of things. Uh, so here we have an example uh, of uh, standards, it's just to, so you see that there is standard, for example, this is extract from ASPRS, uh, that has different uh, level of uh, accuracy classes. And so you will define your survey in relation to the resolution, uh, the density of you want. So if your customer needs some kind of uh, density for the elevation data, uh, you will define the survey and uh, you, you will use a specific camera, specific altitude of flight to reach those specifications. So it's not after once you have your images, uh, then then you are ask yourself uh, now what is the resolution I need for my dem, uh, because maybe the image you have acquired won't have uh, enough resolution to generate that, and it's not recommended to try to push too much. Uh, for example, trying to extract elevation at one to one at each pixel of your images. Uh, so that's the maximal resolution. We have that option in Correlator 3D, but not really recommended because probably you're going to create noises and it's going to be a very big file. So try to define your acquisition uh, parameters to, to get something around five to ten times the resolution of your images when it's time to generate your elevation model. Let's now talk about generating a DSM, a surface model uh, in Correlator 3D. Um, something I might have not mentioned yet is that uh, extracting elevation data by photogrammetry uh, will require uh, some overlap between uh, the, your photos, obviously. So one object needs to be seen from uh, different angles and it's this that will create the stereoscopy and the ability to extract elevation by photogrammetry. Uh, so overlap is very important. So in terms of requirement, and uh, could be a practical way to describe this, is would be say that you need to have a good survey uh, with a constant overlap, uh, parallel flight lines, a straight line, and um, with something between 60 to 80 percent of overlap between your images. So if you don't have enough or if you have too much overlap, uh, this might reduce uh, the quality or the ability for the algorithm to extract elevation. Uh, so overlap is very important. Obviously you will need to have uh, quality images that uh, will be uh, uh, clean and sharp uh, with everything uh, all object well defined. Uh, so this is the basic requirement to uh, extract information from those images by uh, correlation. So the software need to find common feature in both images and then after that uh, with the parallax of uh, the different and created by the different angles it will be able to uh, extract elevation at multiple points. So that is the basic requirement you need for getting high quality DSM. If we look at the uh, option we have in the software uh, when it's time to generate a surface uh, model. So the software will kind of estimate the resolution uh, based on your input raw images and will propose by default an optimal resolution which is five times the resolution of uh, your input image. This is what we have determined to be an optimal density, uh, an optimal resolution that is a good compromise between uh, quality uh, details, uh, processing speed, and so that you are, you will have uh, the, the best result in the best, uh, the faster time. Obviously, you can change that resolution. Uh, you can even go to up to maximal. Maximal would be one to one uh, density, so uh, one elevation at each pixel of your images. So here, for example. 
I have an image that is as 1.3 centimeter resolution. And if I choose maximal, I'm going to generate a surface model at the same density. Obviously, this is something we do not recommend to do except in some very uh, uh, necessity, uh, some ex exception, uh, because that is going to be very long to process and uh, probably be uh, there will be some noises in, in the results because obviously trying to extract elevation at each pixel of your images uh, is, is very uh, demanding in terms of processing and uh, is maybe not the best compromise in terms of uh, quality. So uh, I recommend you to start with an optimal resolution and if you want something a little more denser, you can maybe push that up to three times. So you see in that case, maybe you could go up to 0.3 a three centimeter probably that would give a, a good result if you have a uh, good input uh, and you will have a very high quality dsm with a lot of details and again uh, go back to uh, what i said about input requirement if you need a more denser elevation model well maybe it's because you need to fly a little lower or with a better camera uh, so don't try to push too far uh, the resolution of what you can extract from your images, that's going to be noisy and not necessarily better. Uh, this is a rule of thumbs in photogrammetry. Uh, it's always been like that. About five to ten times the resolution of your image is the best density to extract elevation. And that will be sufficient uh, for uh, many applications, uh, including orthorectification. About producing a point cloud, so if I go back just here, uh, you sort of probably notice, maybe not, but if you want to generate a point cloud, you will need to check the box here, and this will along uh, generating the surface model that will create a point cloud. So let me just remind you that Correlator 3D work with the raster format uh, by default, and so if you don't check that option here, Correlator 3D will just simply generate a raster dam in the GeoTIFF format. And that's what you can edit uh, as well. And if you want to extract a DTM, we'll see that later. But if you need to generate a point cloud uh, in parallel, you need to select that option here. Now you need to ask yourself, if do you really need a point cloud? Because that uh, is going to take a little more long, longer time if you select that option. And so uh, if you don't necessarily need a point cloud, just keep in mind that if what you need is to do ortho, ortho rectification, use a raster uh, for that. So it doesn't, you need the point cloud. So that might be confusing because other software, they kind of absolutely need to extract a point cloud before doing the raster. It's not the case in Correlator 3D. We don't need to create a point cloud and then create a raster. Uh, so if you don't need it, you just leave that unchecked and you generate your raster and that will be used for the auto rectification. How you can manipulate the point cloud in the software if uh, you generate one, they will be uh, displayed here by uh, in the section of the project tree and you can have the point cloud and the, in this example uh, as you can see the point cloud has been colorized on uh, the mosaic so if you generate a mosaic um, first you're going to have a point cloud that will look like this so it will just simply be uh, in uh, color uh, you see so there is no uh, RGB information yet in that point cloud. So if you want to colorize your point cloud based on your mosaic, you will go in the processes here and you will do the point cloud colorization. Uh, you need to have your mosaic selected here. And uh, if you go and do the point cloud colorization, the software will uh, for each point, uh, we'll look into the mosaic and associate the RGB value on, of the mosaic and it will store that in the point cloud for each point. So that way, uh, you will uh, have this artificial uh, way of having your point cloud colorized uh, with the mosaic. So uh, this is what you can do before uh, exporting the LAS. 
So once, uh, as you can see, it's always created in the LAS format for the point cloud. Uh, just maybe note that if you decide to do some more addition, like I will explain in a few minutes about on your DTM or, or your DSM, that will be always possible to export your raster them into a LIDAR LAS at any time. Uh, so uh, if you decide to edit, do some addition in the software, uh, then after that you can save and export into a point cloud again if it's what you need to deliver. Extracting a DTM automatically in Correlator 3D, we have a very powerful tool that uh, will use a surface model and uh, will kind of detect uh, the surface object by looking for a difference of elevation uh, with a certain angles and uh, filter out these objects of this, the uh, elevation model to create a terrain model. Um, so it's a it's an automatic tools. I will show you a little bit how it works. I just want to say before that you have to keep in mind that because it's an automatic tool, in some situation it might give very good result. In other situation, you might need to add some manual editing if you want to reach something uh, accurate. Depending what is your requirement, uh, if you need to generate highly accurate contours. Uh, you might need to include some manual, uh, let's say, break lines or addition, uh, like it's always been done uh, by uh, stereo photogrammetry. Uh, the purpose of the automatic tools in Correlator 3D is very to quickly generate a smooth surface where you have no building, no trees, and that you will most of the time use if you want to do an ortho with the Terran model rather than doing a true ortho. And so there's a couple of uh, things that uh, you need to know is if you, for example, uh, will use that project again. And here we have a surface model in this project. And as you can see, there are these uh, stuck pile over here that are very steep uh, topographic structure. And uh, so if I run the terrain, uh, the DTM extraction, on this project over here, there is good chance that those uh, stockpile will be kind of filtered in a way that I, I will not be happy with because uh, I want to keep those structure as is. I don't want them to be filtered in any way. Uh, so there is a way to use exclusion areas where you will use a polygon uh, that will be defined around the object that you want to keep uh, without any filtering and uh, using this exclusion area um, here. So as you can see, you have this option to use the exclusion area. Uh, you will have a polygon around the object and then if I run the, the, the terrain extraction, um, this part here will not be affected by the filter. And I will probably have a result uh, that will look like this. So you see here the DTM has filtered out all the, all the buildings and the cars, but uh, here we see that this uh, stockpile has been preserved exactly as they were uh, with their uh, all the details. So now if we generate contours, uh, we will have a uh, accurate representation of the terrain. Uh, so here what I'd like to show, uh, I would like you to uh, remind is uh, when it's time to generate a terrain model and using the automatic tools, uh, first have a look to your surface model and ask yourself if there is uh, not some part uh, that you will really like to keep uh, as is. So for example, part that will already be, be uh, bare earth uh, without any uh, trees. Uh, so you can just draw a polygon to exclude those parts from the filtering. And this is already a way to mix manual and automatic uh, 
extractions for uh, the Terran and you will have better result that if you just launch uh, the Terran model on all, all your, your uh, surface model without uh, doing anything. Uh, another case where you maybe would like to do that kind of exclusion area is as you can see here in the graphics, uh, you will use uh, a polygon maybe to keep the bridge uh, because if you want to do the ortho later, you will want the bridge to be perfectly rectified, so you have a straight bridge. If you run the DTM extraction on uh, your DSM and you don't do any exclusion, probably the bridge will kind of be removed or uh, will be smoothed out. And then if you generate the ortho, you will have a bridge that will look like warped. Um, so a way to avoid this is to draw an exclusion area around a bridge and then run the DTM extraction. So these are kind of different strategies to help you extracting a DTM. Uh, even if the tool is very powerful and very fast, uh, it's one of the fastest tool in the software. Uh, inside one minute or two, most of the time, you will extract a DTM from the DSM. Well, Take some time to see if there's not some uh, interaction uh, you could do to get better result. And this would be by using exclusion area or by doing some uh, more manual editing that I will show you in a few minutes. So let's talk about uh, editing dams. Uh, it's a very interesting tool in correlator treaties that the ability you have to edit uh, edit your dam. So um, I'm just going to close this. So uh, if you want to edit a dam and elevation model in Correlator 3D, you have the dam editing module and this offers you a lot of tools to uh, do different tasks in terms of edition. First, the first tool, and I use it for uh, doing a lot of things, is uh, you can draw polygons and you can save these polygons in a shape file. So sometimes I will use the dem editing just to, um, just to draw a polygon and save it, let's say for use as an exclusion area later. So if you were asking yourself how I can generate those exclusion area. Well, you just go in the dem editing module and you can draw the polygon and save it as a shape file. So for example, here, I would like to keep this part. I will draw a polygon around it and I will save it as a, a shape file that I can use later during the DTM extraction. And well, you can also draw polygon for doing different tasks. So if, for example, here, I would like to remove that object from the DSM manually. I can draw a polygon around it and I will use that tools that is delete and fill a selection and what it will do it will filter uh, using the elevation and the polygon on the ground and as you can see uh, it will filter out the object. It's very efficient and very fast. You just go like that, draw a polygon, use the delete and fill and it's uh, deleting the feature from uh, the surface model, as you can see. Uh, and it's interpolating, it's just not filling the surface, it's really interpolating with the elevation of the polygon you're drawing around. Uh, so that is one thing you can do. Another thing is you can, uh, let's say you have uh, water, a lake, and um, as you can see here, if I open a mosaic, I have this small pond surface here. So I could draw a polygon, I'll do it quickly, and uh, use that polygon, as you can see, you can edit point after, and use that polygon to flatten out uh, the surface. So then I will use uh, set elevation of a selection. And what I can do is if you look here on the bottom right, you are seeing uh, the elevation into the, um, in the surface model. So if I move the cursor, I will see what elevation I have. So I can look around here what elevation I have. If I don't know what is the elevation of, of that water body. And I can see, well, it's about 374, maybe 0.4. So I can use that value just to uh, flatten out uh, 
the surface and that will create a sur uh, flat surface like water like that. So uh, as you can see, there's different other tools. There are one you can use to filter a selection. So this will use different uh, type of filter, namely uh, either a main filter or a median filter that can be used to smoothen out I don't know, maybe noise or uh, some edges that are too rough uh, and you want to smooth them out. Uh, you can use uh, first draw polygon and then use the filter uh, inside that polygon. Um, you can also uh, use tools for, uh, if you want a, a crop, for example, your uh, surface model in the small, smallest part. Uh, then you can crop it, uh, it's very quick. Whoop, here I just use delete, that one is used for deleting a part. And um, so this is the delete and this is uh, the crop. So this will crop uh, your dam. So you can see this is uh, very fast. And don't forget to save your dam after that you've done some uh, editing. So here maybe I'm going to give another name if I don't want to overwrite uh, my uh, initial DSM. Um, so I will save it as another name. And now as you can see I have this new DSM edit here in my project and if I want to go back to uh, my initial DSM I just do this and I have my initial DSM as preserved uh, without uh, before the edition. So that's a way you can use a different version. And so the DEM editing module, very useful, a lot of tools and uh, that's how you will get uh, a DEM uh, that uh, will be above uh, the, uh, the other uh, type of them that would be extract without any addition. So just some time by doing a little bit of addition, uh, you will get higher quality uh, from your elevation model. So assessing the dam quality and accuracy of uh, your elevation uh, model, it's very important to understand in terms of when we speak about vertical accuracy, uh, there is a different way that this can be uh, addressed. When you generate a DSM in Correlator 3D, maybe you notice that the software will let you know what is the vertical accuracy, uh, the theoretical vertical accuracy. Here we're talking about 2.3 uh, centimeters. This vertical accuracy here that is giving, given in the software uh, will let you know what is the smallest units that you can kind of extract. Uh, so think about it like uh, the mark on your ruler. So that could be, a, let's say, when you look at your ruler, you have uh, millimeters or maybe 16 of an inch. Uh, that's the smallest thing that you can measure as a precision of your ruler. So here what is telling you is that uh, the smallest uh, unit in elevation that the software can detect is 2.3 centimeters. So everything inside that would be somehow some, some kind of noise. Uh, so uh, this is what the software is telling you. So this is not the absolute accuracy uh, compared to ground truth. It's some kind of relative uh, vertical accuracy of your, uh, if you're doing some uh, vertical measurement, uh, let's say that you will not be able to measure something inside 2.3 centimeter that would make sense. Uh, even if you move the cursor and you see that you have uh, values that are going in millimeters, um, they are not significant in that case. Uh, you will uh, more consider uh, to have something at the accuracy of the centimeter in that case. So that's what is the vertical accuracy is telling you here. If you want to have absolute accuracy, uh, you will need to use uh, checkpoints that are coming from uh, ground truth that have been measured with GPS on the field. And those checkpoints, you can uh, go in processes 
and there's a dam inspection tools uh, where you can take your dam and use the shape files where you will have all your checkpoints as point and uh, the software will generate uh, uh, some statistics about that. Uh, let me just do some uh, very quick paint uh, graphics for you. I would like to explain a couple of things regarding uh, how you can address uh, the vertical accuracy, the absolute vertical accuracy. So if you have a bunch of checkpoints and you're doing statistic on them, on them you will probably have an error that if you have zero here and let's say minus 10, I'm just giving an example, and here you have plus 10, so this is the potential error. So you might have a distribution of your error that will look like this. Okay, and uh, well, this is kind of a normal distribution. Let's just say that usually the, uh, the air vertical error doesn't always have a normal distribution, or for the sake of uh, my explanation, I'm using normal distribution. And you will have a mean error that will be somewhere here. And as you can see, because you have a mix of negative error or positive error, if you're doing just the mean of the error, this will tend to be somewhere about zero. Uh, so uh, calculating uh, the mean error or you, of your vertical difference is not enough, obviously, to uh, to address or assess the vertical accuracy. However, what it can let you know, it can tell you about the bias. As you can see in this example here, I have a mean error that tend to be a little bit uh, a little bit under zero, maybe minus one, and so this is just telling me that I have some kind of bias in negative error, and so. Here I have maybe a systematical error of minus one. That's what a mean will tell you. But if you want to have a more, um, how can I say, a, a statistics about uh, your vertical accuracy, uh, you will be using the RMMSC, uh, which is the rune mean square error. So this will be calculating uh, by doing uh, the, the root uh, of this, this the sum of the difference of your point in elevation. So if you have different uh, different point, so the square difference, so that will be the RMSC most, mostly. So it's the, um, the square difference, uh, the sum and root of this will give you uh, something that is uh, more, um, a valid number for um, addressing the accuracy uh, because doing the root of the square will kind of uh, turn everything into positive error and then if you do the mean of that so the sum and divided by the frequency uh, then you will have uh, something more like an absolute error um, but another way as well to uh, to to uh, qualify your vertical error is to use the linear error as, at 90% uh, 90, 90 confidence or 95%. So you will see the LE90. Uh, so this will be, let's say you have now all the absolute error and you have a distribution of your error like that. Well, if you have all your error into 90% confidence, uh, so what is the num what is the value uh, that will be the uh, linear error 90 degrees or 90% uh, or 95% um, error. So that's another way uh, you can use, uh, you will address uh, the, um, the uh, vertical error of your uh, elevation data. Uh, just what I wanted you to remind in, in that explanation is that sometimes people will say, oh, I want my data to be that accurate, or I want that accuracy. And it's very important to uh, try and determine what, what accuracy are we talking about. So are we, are you, are we looking for uh, RMSC or LA 90%? Uh, so it's important to, uh, to know uh, what, what is the... Um, the um, what is the statistic you will use to address your uh, 
uh, your quality because you cannot just go in your dam and looking at looking at a point and then you say oh i have an error of that at that point uh maybe you just look at a blunder and uh, so you really need to use more uh more points to and establish statistics uh by one of these uh way of uh, addressing the uh um the accuracy Treating the contours from a dam and correlator treaty is very simple. Um, so how to generate the contours? Well, as I explained, usually you will extract the contour from a DTM, from a Terran model, and you will go into uh, here the processes and you have the dam contour extraction. And so uh, you have the option to determine the interval of each contour. So. Uh, all lines, what is the elevation of each ISO line you will generate. Uh, so what is a good contour to use? Uh, again, a rule of thumb would be to um, to select an interval that will be at least two times your vertical accuracy. Uh, so if you have a vertical accuracy of, of uh, 10 centimeters, well, if you generate contours inside that accuracy, obviously you will kind of uh, having noises in, in your contours. So uh, the rule of thumb is at least two times the vertical accuracy of your elevation model. And let's here go, uh, let's say just at 50 centimeter to show you quickly the result. And you see it's very fast. Uh, you will have the contours that are generated and then you can save them as a shape file. In correlator 3D, this is something I may be shown a little bit during all the webinar, but you are going to generate a different version of them. And that uh, for this reason, uh, you will have all the them you are generating can be overlay in the them section. So DTM, DSM, they will be all share uh, in the same uh, section. So you can generate as much version as you want. Just be careful to name them in a way that you know what version or what, uh, what it is representing. So I tend to use just the simple name DSM uh, like this when I have generate my surface model and DTM uh, when I extract a DTM for a surface model. And if I made use some edition, I uh, will maybe rename it edit uh, one, two, or three. And that way I will manage my different version. At any time, as you can see, you can save your dem into another file and to another version. And so there is no limit in the number of them you can uh, manage in the software. You, let's, let's see, you can also import existing dem to the project that will be coming from another source. Uh, so uh, you can just uh, use that uh, option here to add them to the project and they will be added in the section. So uh, you will generate, uh, you will manage all your dem here in the dem section. There is also a tool that allow you to merge them together. And so the dam merging will use different inputs that usually should probably uh, overlay a little bit on each other. And they're going to be merged uh, together. So if let's say you have a very big project and you have might, uh, maybe you have generated uh, different parts of your project into different DSM because you wanted different people to uh, different resources to edit uh, these uh, different dams. And after that, you can use the dam merging tools to, to merge them back together into a single file. And so this uh, will be used for doing this. Um, finally, performing change detection in correlator 3D, uh, we have a tool uh, that is available again in the processes, change detection, and it will use uh, a reference dam and a comparison dam. 
And so there could be different um, situation where you would like to do this. Uh, maybe you have uh, generated a surface model of different dates over time. Let's say so uh, one year you have generated DSM. A year after you generated a new DSM. So you can use the change detection tool to uh, extract the differences there is between, uh, let's say, the two different dam. You could also use that uh, to see what are the differences between your surface model and your terrain model. So it would kind of use to extract uh, just maybe a canopy, for example, if you have the ground and the top of the trees, that could be used for that. And there's also the option to display the change uh, on the mosaic and so if you do this, you would have uh, the output result uh, generated on your mosaic. So if maybe I just simulated that, I will use here the DTM and the DSM. And you have to select your uh, input mosaic. You will select uh, S, uh, the SBD file. And then you select an output folder. So I have created uh, here that folder change. And here you will... Uh, set uh, what do you consider to be a change so uh, here in this example by default anything under tree or, or over 15 meter will not be considered a change yeah I might change that I will put 0.1 and I will maybe put a higher value uh, that what I consider change and if I process it's uh, usually quite quick to get your uh, result. It will generate a raster of the changes and it will also uh, overlay the difference on an output mosaic. Uh, so here I have the changes that are uh, generated. And if I open a mosaic, now I'm going to load the mosaic that I put in change uh, you can see in blue uh, the differences that are from the surface model and the terrain model so obviously this is all what have been filtered out so you see the trees and the cars uh, everything that has been uh, filtered out on uh, on the DSM to create the DTM. Um, so that change detection tool will be usually used more for uh, an urban uh, expansion application where you want to see what are the new buildings or uh, what are the building that uh, has been destroyed. Uh, you can use a uh, different surface model of different time period to uh, do that kind of things. So this is for the change detection. And this completes uh, our today's online training session. Thank you for attending. Uh, I hope uh, it was useful and you enjoyed that uh, presentation. And we'll see you for the next one. Thank you and bye-bye.